Hi, my name is Eric Recklin, and the initial title of my talk was Teaching a New Dog Old Tricks. That's in the theme of cryptic titles for HHC talks. But I added the subtitle, Using Floppy Disks in 2023, just to help with some SEO when this gets published. <laughs> So those of us who play with old electronics probably have a lot of old floppy disks lying around. Yeah, and things that work with these floppy disks. But at the same time, computers these days don't have floppy drives and haven't for some time. So uh, but you, can still get them. you can still get them, but it makes it difficult to use these disks. And yeah, and also these old computers that use floppy drives may not have any easy way to communicate with modern computers to get data from those floppy disks to them. So how do you get data off these old floppies? And also, if you actually want to use these old devices, how do you put data on floppies to put onto those old computers and handhelds? There are various solutions that you can try today that have varying degrees of compatibility. Uh, USB floppy drives exist, three and a half inch disks. They work perfectly well with DOS formatted high density three and a half inch floppies. They can work with 720K double density as well, but they don't work for basically anything else. Good thing that is they're pretty cheap. I think this one, I found this on Amazon, was like 30 bucks or something. Something that will give you a little bit more compatibility was that until about a decade ago, you could still plug a floppy drive into a modern computer motherboard. And a computer from a decade ago can still run Windows 10, which is still supported by Microsoft for a couple more years. So you can still have a relatively modern computer that you can still feel safe plugging into a network without needing all sorts of firewalls and everything. And put your three and a half and five and a quarter inch floppy drives in there and work with those disks. But there are some disadvantages to this. First, you have to store and maintain yet another computer. Second of all, it's not a long-term solution. Yes, you can use that now, but 10 years from now, that's going to become less something you would want to do. And it still is not going to work with some of the more obscure formats of floppy disks. Yes? Uh, when I you know, assembled the, the tower computer that I'm now using, I don't know how many years ago, uh, I, I remembered uh, that I wanted to have a floppy drive. Mm -hmm. And then just the other day, and because everything is black and so the table, I looked at it and said, oh, I do have a floppy drive. Now, I have that drive, and I've got, you know, over the history of the club, tons and tons of floppy disks. Uh, are you recommending maybe I should go through there and see if there's anything of use? And oh, let's, l let's go through the rest of my talk first oh, and okay, see what other things I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that came up is that sometimes you can put that floppy disk in that drive and work with it, but apparently unless the computer, the floppy controller is more than 25 years old, there can be some timing difficulties working with that floppy disk too. So it might partially work, but not 100%. So what are some of the problems we have with disks that are not compatible? So standard PC floppy disks are 525 bytes a sector. They use MFM encoding, and they spin at typically 300, 360 RPM. I think, I think most are 300, but there's some variations that are 360. And they're all constant angular velocity. There are other formats of floppies that we still encounter that do not match these specifications. The HP lift floppies that you used with HP 71, 75, 91, 21, 22, those kinds of things, they might be 256 or 1,024 bytes a sector. And also they spin at 600 RPM. Then to make things even more complicated, the Macintosh double density three and a half inch floppies were not 720K, they were 800K. And they did this by running at constant linear velocity, so varied speed from 394 to 590 RPM. There is no way you can physically work with one of those disks with a PC floppy controller. It just will not work. Also, they have GCR encoding, which is a different kind of encoding. Eric, yes? Um, the 400K floppies mm -hmm. on the Mac also were 400 instead of 360. Yes. 
Wozniak did all that himself so they could have higher capacity than the PCs that were out there. Oh, interesting. One up everybody. <laughs> yeah. So we need a special software and hardware solution to deal with some of these more obscure formats. There have been several options in the past. A while ago, the only choice was to go with a specialized data recovery firm unless you actually had the old equipment needed to work with these disks. Uh, more recently, there is a commercial product uh, called Cryoflux. It's a proprietary solution, a software and hardware combination, and the cheapest version of it, the basic version for personal use only, but $120. And also, because it's proprietary, you're limited by whatever formats it supports, which is a fairly extensive list, but not everything will be on there. But now, in the last few years, there is a open source free solution. First, the hardware, it's called Grease Weasel. And I think from the name, it may have originally been uh, real, primarily for Amiga-based things, because there's some other products with similar names for the Amiga. And it's low cost. It's open source hardware that designs on GitHub, and various places around the world sell it, sell the circuit board. It's about $30 in the US, 37 Canadian, 28, 28 pounds, 26 euros. And it looks like, oh, yes. Does the system automatically recognize, or you have to? Let me get to that, oh. okay. <laughs> so what this product does, is it acts like a special floppy controller. There's a microcontroller in there. It has a USB interface on one side, a traditional floppy connector on the other side. And you can plug into it a regular floppy cable, which would support two IBM PC style drives, three and a half, five and a quarter inch. It also supports Schuchart mode, which supports three simultaneous drives. It supposedly works with eight inch drives too. I do not own any eight inch drives. I have not tried that. It has a a three and a half inch power connector, male, four pin, on there for providing power to a three and a half inch floppy drive, the modern ones that only need five volts since USB doesn't provide 12. However, it was, it was a strange choice in my opinion because you'd need a female to female three and a half inch power cable which exist but they're not something most people probably have lying around. If I were to have designed this, I would have said put a four pin Molex, so you put one of those four pin Molex to four pin, three and a half inch adapters that you probably have a bunch of in a box somewhere. And the way this works is that it's not actually trying to read or interpret the data off the drive. All this is doing is it's interpret, it's taking in the magnetic flux that the drive reads, effectively analog data, and then it sends that to your computer. So for a small floppy disk that might be a few hundred kilobytes, it may be multiple megabytes of uh, digitized uh, analog magnetic flux data that gets sent to your computer. What this means is that anything that the magnetic read write head of your floppy drive is capable of doing, this can work with. It doesn't matter what the limitations of an IBM PC floppy controller are, it doesn't matter encoding, anything like that, this can all be done in software. Think of it kind of like a software defined radio but in this case, instead of being for radio, it's for uh, magnetic flux on a floppy disk. Eric, can you buy the thing fully made? Yes. Uh, pretty, there are various options that you can do here. So the circuit board itself, as I said, is $30 or so. This I bought with a case. In fact, the vendor I bought this from is here in Florida, and it was $7 extra with the plastic case then a couple dollars more for all the mounting hardware bolts. And you can either, I think you can buy it, the whole thing pre-assembled, but I just bought those components and screwed it all together. It wasn't di difficult to assemble. That's what the board looks like on its own. The other part of the solution is software called Flux Engine. And it's, again, free open source software. It's available for Windows and Mac. I was testing just the Windows version. Uh, the developer, David Given, has published all this information on GitHub as well. And what this software does is it works directly with the Grease Weasel, so they can connect to your multiple floppy drives that are plugged into that. It then reads the flux in. It can write that flux to a flux file, or it can 
interpret that flux file into a drive image. In other words, the actual binary data, data that you can work with. You can then mount that image with disk image software. You could, or the, do the opposite direction. You can, down, you can download a lift file from the internet, which then converts it to the flux and writes it to the disk. So it works both directions. It has a lot of different formats built into it. Of course, common stuff like DOS, DOS formatted floppies, HP lift support, Amiga. It works with Mac disks, even the 800 kilobyte CLV disks, CPM, a whole lot more. There's a long list of them. There's a, the, the first link on here, the main website, this one isn't quite as up to date as if you just look at the source code. If you look at the source code, you can see there are a lot more formats than are fully documented on the main website. And I've been very impressed with the support given by the author. So I picked this up beginning of the year. In fact, I'll, I'll pass it around so you guys can look at it. Now that I know where it is. Uh, initially, it had some support for HP lift disks, but it did not support what I was specifically looking for, and that was HP 71 lift disks. But the good thing is because it was open source, I was able to look at the way they supported the HP format and come up with a new configuration to work with the lift disks. I didn't really know what I was doing, so I made something that I was able to read the disks with, but I couldn't write or do anything else. But I submitted my code changes to the, the developer, David, and he pretty quickly responded back and enhanced it to add write support, and then even took it one step further and added the ability to work with the lift file system. So one other feature this software has, not only does it work with the grease weasel for the hardware and work with the flux images, and work with the disk images, it also can extract files from the, from the disk images. So it works with the DOS format to read the FAT files, and it also works with the LIF format to read the files out of there as well. And he was continuing adding more support. It seems like every, at least every month there's another release out there on the GitHub site, but every couple weeks it seems like he's checking more features in, and he encr encourages you to submit flux images to him of formats that are not supported to add support for them. Yes? How would you obtain the flux image? I mean. If you have the physical floppy disk and the grease weasel hardware, you can use the software to say make a flux image. And then you just have this file that can be interpreted into, a, into the actual data if it supports it. And if it doesn't, then you would need to have support added That's for incredible. that. This whole project is incredible. Yeah, it's really amazing what they've put together. Eric, can, does it, can the software uh, detect the format? I'll get to that in a bit. Yes and no. Yeah, that's no fine. Yes? Since you're working with the flux there, has anybody given any consideration to trying to read the tape drives for like HP 85s and HP 98 I don't know if there's any been if there's been any discussion about tapes as well, this software is exclusively for floppies, but maybe there could be tape supported at it as well if there's enough interest and appropriate hardware to work with the tape that can pull that flux data off. Some people have that also with uh, early hard drives. So what can this do for us? Right now it has built-in support for four different HP formats. Martin Hepperly put together a document describing many, many different formats that HP systems have used back in the 1980s. And some of them are documented more than others, but it's a, it's a pretty good brief overview of them. One thing that was particularly confusing for me is at that time, and even true now, that people are a bit loose about the difference between kilobytes and kibibytes. And you never really know are they talking about binary or decimal byte, uh, kilobytes. And furthermore, sometimes they're including the reserve space in there, sometimes they're not. So if they say, this size floppy, what floppy is it really? I'm not sure. But the format that I was most interested in here was the 616 kilobyte 9114 disk, which is used by the 41, the 7175, since a lot of those are in Joe's lift disk project. And what started all this is when I was scanning the stuff from Richard, included in there was a floppy disk for the 71 or 5, I can't remember now, I think it was 71, and I had no idea how to work with it. These are some of the other, for, the other formats it supports. And it could support a lot more, I think. 
uh, it would be pretty easy to add support for additional lift floppies. It's just a matter of entering in the number of bytes per sector, number of sectors, number of tracks, and the position of, uh, position of everything relative to each other. Another thing useful for it that I personally use it for is some of the HP 48 programs that came with floppies, again from Richard's collection, were on Mac 800 kilobyte disks, and this read those just fine. And the third thing is, I have a modern computer, I have no floppy drive, and I still have DOS, DOS floppies. Yes, I could use a USB floppy drive, but this works too. I can read DOS floppies with it. Now, but with reference to all the projects you're working on, mm -hmm. I have, like I say, a huge pile of these from all kinds of sources, many of those with mm -hmm. you. Before I <laughs> toss them out, should, should I... Uh, Send them to you or photograph them? I th <laughs> well, there's only so many, there are only so many things I can do, but well, if, if, yeah, if, if you can look through them and see which ones might, might sound relevant, pictures yeah, of them or de the descriptions of them or reasons. something could be useful. There could be a few I might want, maybe. Yeah, I'm sure there are. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? You said you had 800K Mac disks. Yes. Do you use a Mac drive? Or no. Really? That's the greatest thing, so I'll get to that in a little bit. So what I what I have personally set up for working with everything here is uh, Grease Easel version four with the 3D printed case and hardware was forty dollars and sixty nine cents. On went on Amazon and bought an AC power adapter. It just plugs into the wall. It's switched, and then it has a four pin Molex connector coming out of it for five volts and twelve volts. And it was only sixteen ninety nine. But what made it even more interesting, it came with something I didn't need, which is a a USB to parallel ATA and serial ATA adapter too. So I think it's designed for working with old hard drives. You can make an external hard drive, but all I needed was the power supply, and this was pretty much the cheapest way to get a power supply that looked like that. Then I got a, a, a Y splitter cable that took a five and a quarter inch Molex to the five and a quarter inch and three and a half inch connectors, which I'm sure I had one lying around, but it was just $2.85 to add to my Amazon purchase, so I did that. <laughs> And then what I had in my closet was a Sony model MPF 520E floppy drive. I bought that back in 96. It's just a regular PC floppy drive. And then also I had a Canon model 5501 cross-listed with, with an IBM part number, five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Uh, fairly modern as far as five and a quarter inch drives are concerned from 92. And then also what I had in my closet was just a USB A to B cable to plug it into the computer. And this is what my setup looks like. So you can see there's my five and a quarter inch, my three and a half inch, the AC adapter, USB cable, and this is the grease weasel with the ribbon cables connecting everything. And from this, it looks like I probably need a 3D printed case to make all of this look neat. What some people have done is HP actually made some external five and a quarter inch full height enclosures for tape drives, I believe. People took the tape drive out put, the, put these, all this hardware inside, and then had a single thing, although those were quite bulky and heavy also, and more expensive than I was willing to pay on eBay. So yeah, it just works with regular PC drives. Again, it would support eight inch in theory. I just don't have one or any need for one. I'm gonna do a quick video. This is something I learned when I was looking at floppy disks that I always think that when I think of floppy disks, I only remember the automatic shutter ones, but there were actually other variations on them. When floppy drives first came out, and this is important if you're working with old HP equipment, the very first ones only had manual floppy drive shutters. So you would have to manually open the shutter, stick the, drive, the disk in the drive, and then work with it and close the shutter after you took it out. But then, HP had an updated version of the floppy drive that worked with those manual shutters, but also could work with automatic shutters. So you put the disk in and it opens the shutter automatically for you. But then what they also, what also existed were disks that could work in either system. So it would be a manual shutter, you could open it manually, stick it in the old drive, or you could just leave it closed, stick it in the new drive and it opens automatically. And I have one of each floppy disk here that I'm going to do a quick video showing how they work. So first, this is the manual shutter, fully manual. You just slide it open. 
and then slide it closed. Completely oh, manual. manual. Now there's this. This is the HP hybrid one. So <coughs> if you open it normally, it's just like an automatic shutter. It closes on its own. But if you open it all the way, it locks. And you pinch the disc in the corner to close it. And then finally, the modern style of I shouldn't say modern ones from the 40 years ago, but it just opens and closes on its own. <laughs> if, you, if you notice, the shape of the hole is different on all three types. Yeah, so you can visually see from a distance which type it is which. It was funny, the second one says auto shutter, which is interesting when it's also manual shutter. But I guess that was special back then. Yeah. Fully, fully automatic, semi-automatic. <laughs> this is what the Flux Engine software looks like. Here's the main screen. So you pick, here I have two drives connected, my three and a half, my five and a quarter. You pick the drive, or you can pick a Flux file as a source, or the disk image. And then here I pick the type of drive. I said it's a three and a half inch 80 track, 135 track per inch drive. Then it has, these are all your different options under IBM. So I picked IBM for the format. These are the options. You could, here not, here's an option that says try to auto detect, which is what was being asked about, but it also says unreliable. So I would say if you know what it is, pick what you, pick what you know it is. If you're not sure, pick what you think it is. And if it doesn't work, try another format until it gives you reasonable data. Because it can, even if you give it something totally different, it'll still attempt to interpret the flux data. It'll just have a whole bunch of errors and will not give you usable data. Here is a picture of what it looks like while it's reading a disk, or I should say just after it read a disk. So here I put a three and a half inch double density disk in. It's showing you all the, I guess all the sectors going all the way out. And as it's reading, these little green boxes show up. And then it shows the, the this is kind of, kind of a graph showing how it's reading the magnetism off the disk. And whether, it's, whether some of the settings are right, you might be able to tell by where the peaks are. I'm not, I don't fully follow how that work, part works. Another feature, reading a disk image. So you pick this, you give it a file name. One limitation is the file name's extension must be .img. And if your file name's extension is .lif or something that, like that, it will fail. So you just have to rename it to .img. And then, again, you pick the format here. I picked HP lif. These are the four choices it supports. I picked 616 kilobytes. And then you can you can browse the files to see the contents of that. So right here, this is something that makes that HP Dura utility no longer is necessary. Notice here, these are all the files on this HP 75 lift disk. It says the format, basic 75, text 75, and so on, gives the size. And you can then just save each individual file. Yes? Now this is only for reading. Uh, you're only reading to get it in your system to do right, it. Well, right, right. Don't write them. <laughs> well, it supposedly supports writing. I have not experimented with that. I think that's something that would be worthwhile. I don't have any hardware that can work with these disks. I don't have a floppy drive for my 75 or 71 or anything. So I have, had, I have no way of testing this. But I'm sure if others would, then we could verify this works. But it won't read on the old. I, I've I've heard that. Yeah, so it it would be useful to have additional drives lying around. All I had were these high density drives, which again, as he said, is perfectly fine for reading, but it may not work for writing. As a way of preserving your disk, is that's what you tend to do? You could take the various writing uh, formats and read them, and then write them all to the one common format. Yeah. So Eric, this is a bit copy, not a sector copy. There used to be a difference when things were copy protected. It, it's, 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 it's below the level of a bit copy. Yeah. Though. I can get below a bit because your bits aren't recorded on the disk. Once right. The transitions are on the disk. Which you, right. So in other words, it should be able to copy in something that had some arcane copy protected scheme on it. I, I don't know the full answer to that. I think if it depends on the type. The answer is yeah, yes and no. It's stepping, reading, 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 stepping, reading
You're trying to get rid of a bit and a yes no, aren't you? Because the ones that have a physical hole in there, they won't be able to deal with If they damage the disc, yeah, you're out of luck. Also, also, if there's too much distance between flux transitions, which can't normally happen, then it'll read unreliably. It won't read consistently from read to read, and some software depends on that for the copy protection. Eric, I was going to ask that question. Does it? There are situations where uh, aging disks essentially retries will get it. Like yes, it has. It has built-in automatic retrying that will keep trying until it gives up. So you can even view the files too. This was a file off the lift disk. It, this is just what I was saying before, that if you have a disk image saved, you can then use other software to read that disk image as well. HP Dura for lift disks, or if it's a DOS floppy, a couple free programs I found, OSF Mount, which is freeware, MDisk Toolkit, which is open source, those will take a PC formatted disk image and mount it as a drive in Windows. Here are screenshots of what those look like, each of the two different packages. I'm going to show you a, demo, a video demo now of using the software. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. So clicking read disk. And this is actual speed of reading a 360 kilobyte, five and a quarter inch floppy disk. It just takes less, well under a minute. You can see there it's showing the Re the flux readings there. And now it finished reading. So now I can go back. And then I can hit browse files. And there it shows all the files in the disk. And I can click a file and click view. And there's the contents of the file. Wow. What formats can it view? <laughs> I've only experienced, so it just views the file in plain text. As far as what file systems it can interpret, I've only tried it with PC and LIF. I can't remember if I tried Mac. Or, I might have tried Mac too, I can't remember. But if it's now. a binary file and you view it. Oh, well, yeah, you, that's why you just save it and then you view it in whatever program you want to view it in. If you, can you extract the file, an individual file? Yeah, that's what the, the save button right here would save that individual file. And if you pull something out of a LIF archive or a LIF image, does it have the LIF header? I don't file? know. Okay. I don't know enough about LIF to answer that. My guess, though, is if it doesn't work the way you want it, it's, again, something you look at the code and you can, it can be yeah. modified easily. All right, any more questions? Yes. Eric, it, um, it sounds as though it runs good. Disk That's correct, yes. It reads to an image, then works with that image so that you're not putting any more wear on that disk or anything. And these are just URLs for the things I mentioned. This is an interesting Wikipedia article, just a whole bunch of different floppy formats. This is Martin Hepperly's document I mentioned. And this is from the HP 9845 website that has a lot of good HP floppy information. Thank you. <laughs>